Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Sign of the Times. What a wonderful week we've been having. I want you to sit back tonight, hit the share button. Let's get ready to go for a ride of epic proportions tonight. We're gonna have a time tonight. Hit the share button, get ready as we talk about the sign of the times with Pastor R.J. Stevenson out of Tampa, Florida. Let's do this tonight. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. It's a beautiful day that the Lord has made. We just want to thank you again for um, you taking time out of your schedule to be with us uh, during times like this. It means the world to me personally, your support, your kind words. It means so much. I know you don't have to do it. You can be doing so many other things. If you're on Facebook, then that means you can be surfing Facebook, but instead you think in your heart that it is not robbery for you to say, I want to hear what's going on. And so it means so much to me, the fact that we've got some special guests. Listen, last night, if you didn't see last night, show, you need to go to our YouTube channel, hit like and subscribe. That show last night was absolutely stupid. I love it. <laughs> we got into it. We nailed some things. We made a start. And so we're picking right back up tonight with another great show. We're believing that tonight is going to be an even, I believe we're going to go even to another realm, another level tonight. Tomorrow night, tomorrow night, we're going to have uh, Miss Melissa Elliott, who is a city councilwoman in Henderson, North Carolina, who is uh, running a program, gang awareness program in Henderson. And we want to get her on here tomorrow night and talk about the effects of gangs. Does gang life matter? We're going to talk about these things. How was the pandemic and all the tension that's going on around the world? How is that affecting our young people in the inner city area? Go to our YouTube channel, Sign of the Times, David Bright Austin, like and subscribe. Hit the share button tonight. Share this broadcast. We need to get some people on here hearing uh, some positive things and giving us some direction. That being said, my friends, I'm ready to get down to it. I'm so grateful. So many of you watch, so many of you comment. So many of you uh, add to this show and it keeps us going. And a few days ago, last week, we had a show on here and it just got so overwhelming that one of our participants that kept chiming in, I said to myself, anyone that's doing all that talking behind the scenes need to come up front and say something. And I asked him to come on and he consented to come on. And so I want you all to help me welcome um, a young man that is going to really empower us tonight. He is the pastor of New St. Paul AME Church all the way down in Tampa. I can say down because I'm up here in North Carolina in Tampa, Florida. Please help me welcome to Sign of the Time, Pastor R.J. Stevenson. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you for uh, allowing us to 
come and talk to you tonight or you come and talk to us tonight. Thank you for, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I was watching uh, last week. Uh, I've been in revival. Uh, this is our 11th week of revival. I've done, I did a revival for 10 straight weeks called the Revival of Hope. And I took two weeks off and we're back into uh, the revival of justice now uh, for such a time as this. I, I, was, on, I was watching, uh, you were talking to Apostle uh, McNair, Apostle Aaron McNair. And uh, he is a, a hero of mine. And I was like, wow, you know, let me jump into this conversation. I, I wanted to get to the nitty gritty. And so I was commenting back and forth and I've been following your show ever since I was watching on last night. I was watching on the other night as well when you had the panel. And uh, I, I'm just impressed by the, the kind of content uh, that you're bringing and the, the provocative conversations that you're having. And uh, I'm a little bit straight shooter and I'll just be talking about what I'm talking about. I, that's what I like. Uh, we're gonna have, for those of you that, um, saw last night we're going to do part two we having a different panel one of our uh people that was chiming in last night i said you know he made the comment put me on the show i said okay so he's gonna be on here friday we're gonna go at it again uh, someone said last night if you i'm telling you if you didn't watch last night someone said last night the last night show was better than cnn and that's yeah. what it seemed like we were like cnn and we're gonna do it again on friday but tonight uh pastor stevenson uh thank you for coming on and I want to get your perspective. You said you're a straight shooter. That is what we need during times like this, especially as a pastor um, that is not 75 years old, that some may say is out of touch, that you know what happened in 1960 can't be duplicated in 2020. What do you see is going on in Tampa? Because uh, different areas of the nation experienced different things but yet we're still under this one umbrella of dealing with the coronavirus as well as dealing with the racial tension that some people have said recently that we should get over it it's no big deal and and, and i'll say this and i'll let you have the floor i mentioned last week that i think that the coronavirus i said this with apostle mcnair the coronavirus and racism are twins because they're twins in the aspect that most people don't think that it really exists until they have to deal with it. So yeah. talk, to us, talk to us. Yeah, uh, the coronavirus really took us all by surprise. Uh, it was the first time that I can remember uh, that we have all felt the pain of fear, meaning uh, we were, af we were afraid to touch people. We were, mm -hmm. we were afraid to walk out of the house uh, we using hand sanitizer and Lysol and masks and gloves like never before. Uh, but it seemed to me, uh, one, the church had a particular perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. We jumped all into trying to figure out how to live stream. Uh, yeah. We jumped all into trying to figure out how to get our cameras right and does the sound. Mm -hmm. And then how come his screen looked like that? I want my screen to look like his screen. I, where they get all them lights from? I want my lights to look like their light. And to an extent, we got so caught up in the lights, camera, and the action that the devil caught us by surprise. And uh, evil, evil reared his head, and we got uppercut by some by by ism that's always been around us, but was sleeping because we don't often. Uh, talk about racism. We don't often talk about prejudice. Uh, it waits until something happens to somebody. We find a new hashtag and then we lift up a banner. Uh, but I think that um, social justice, I think that uh, um, cultural differences, I think that cultural similarities should be an ongoing conversation because it ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. It's it just even from the time of them folks at the Tower of Babel, when God struck everybody with different languages and we couldn't understand each other ever since, we've always been split. We've always been separated. Uh, racism is a biblical thing. Uh, you find out through the Bible that there were different countries, the Amalekites, there were different enemies of the people of God. And this has always been the case. The, the, the issue that I'm having with is racism in America does not stand up for the concept uh, the mission and vision statement that we're given in the Constitution. Uh, America was supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. And America became the death place of slaves. America became a place where uh, the have-nots and the have-it-alls 
uh, don't always see eye to eye. America has become a place that's, that looks a whole lot more like uh, places of desolation, like Lodabar, uh, places of desecration, like uh, the place where Lot and his family were, uh, than it does the promised land that we make people believe that it is. And I believe that we as a church, as a society, as people, as citizens have a tremendous responsibility to, uh, to, to lift the standard uh, that says that this is a country uh, where people can have liberty and justice for all. What about what about people, those that say that the church isn't a place to discuss that, that we're all under one umbrella, we're all one flesh, one, you know, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, that the church is not the place to discuss it? The church has always been the place to discuss it. Um, mm -hmm. The church had always been the place where we ironed out our issues. Uh, back even to Martin Luther uh, not, uh, nailing the 95 Thesis on the town square, the church has always been a place where we talked about what God standards and moral standards are. Um, unfortunately, uh, based on how the church and government works, based on how uh, the church and people's perspectives often plays out, uh, the voice of the church has sort of become watered. Um, the church doesn't necessarily speak with the voice of the community anymore. Uh, the community doesn't respect the voice of the church or its leaders anymore. And the church has uh, a little bit of work to do, some mountains to climb to speak truth to power, because we got to do that in a consistent way. And speaking up when somebody hits us isn't the right time to speak up because then we're speaking out of emotion. Uh, but we should always be the ones lifting up for the voice of the community. Mm -hmm. that, that that's true. Uh, what you know, we we should be that voice. What do you think has caused that disconnect between the church and the community? Um, the same thing that caused uh folks to tell us that the the red carpet and the red cushions in the chairs was meant to be the blood of Jesus, and it was really the fact that when you went to the carpet store, that's the carpet that your budget could afford. Uh, <laughs> we've made some sacred places. Uh, and we've told some sacred stories about what we really couldn't explain. Um, and be, so because of that, we just got along to go along. And that's not really the way that we can make a standard. And so now you see this blurred line between uh, what we should be lifting up as a standard, because the church for a long time, the church hasn't collectively said anything. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we walked through segregation and prejudice in the 60s and 70s. The church, uh, we were on the corners. We were doing souls to the polls but the church never really collectively said anything. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen the definition of marriage uh, come under attack. The church hasn't really said anything. Uh, we, as the church, have allowed nonprofit organizations to become doing the ministry uh, that the church was always known to do. And so we've uh, had to uh, watch our 501c3 statuses because you know we need that additional money, but it has also come with the cost. Uh, mm -hmm. We've allowed our voice to be compromised. And um, I'm hoping that uh, Corona, COVID-19, I'm hoping that the death of our loved, one, of loved ones in our communities has been the wake up call that the church has needed to finally get over our stupid stuff and pull it together for the sake of the nation. Um, Dartez Wright posts a question. Do you think we need uh, black church reform, more, more educating the people and less prosperity messages? Um, I do think we need more church reform. Uh, I'm not going to touch the messages part because uh, I, I like to be led by the Holy Spirit. Um, so when it is that I stand behind the second desk and I speak on behalf of God, I got to be saying what God would say. I got to speak with his character. So whatever it is, I, I can't tell another man or woman of God to, uh, to, to have a particular perspective. I'm only responsible for what I say. Uh, I think that the church does, uh, the black church definitely needs to, to be reforming itself. Um, I have an opportunity to be a part of a, a summit coming up called the Rethinking Church Summit, where we're renegotiating what it is that the church looks like moving forward, because the church of tomorrow will never look like the church of the past. Um, I'm wondering uh, how it is that now when the church, all, all churches are worrying, we're wondering and worrying about number decline before mm -hmm. Corona. Corona hit, and then everybody was wondering would the church be able to last? We shifted over to social media, we shifted over to live streaming, but we're still not evangelizing. We're still not doing discipleship 
Um, what if God breaks the internet? Uh, you'll see real reform then. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question for you. Uh, we have a, a, there's a question on the screen from Dr. Uh, Stephen Gardner, but leading into his question, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, it, it seems like now in America, we have three churches. We have three churches. We have the black church. We have the white church. And we have, and of course, we have other uh, ethnicities. We, But just looking, I'll say it like this. I want to look at three of the churches, the black church, the white church and the mixed church. OK, you know, I'm not talking about we do have a Latino, or Asian. We have uh, we have different denominations, but the black church, the white church and the mixed church, you have three. One side is saying one thing. The other side is saying the other thing. The mixed church in the middle is fighting as to which side to lean toward. Dr. Gardner is asking, there are certain, well, he's saying there are certain powers uh, that does not want the church to be a voice of justice. And my, my uh, question is flipping his statement around. He says there are, and I'm asking you, are there certain powers, in your opinion, that does not want the church to be a voice of justice? Is it the, one of these three churches that I talked about? Uh, justice uh, seems to have become a concept of convenience. Uh, justice has become, uh, is it just about us? Um, the, the, the interesting thing that I'm seeing about the black church is uh, that the black church is regaining its voice inside its own community. Um, the white church is being challenged to say something and the mixed church is realizing that a person who is a multicultural pastor but does not have a multicultural lifestyle really cannot give services to the cultures. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're a person that embraces people coming into your church, but the leadership of your church does not look like your congregants, you're really not a multicultural church. If, mm -hmm. if you're a multicultural pastor, but you don't have friends of other cultures that are in your home, that are part of your family, uh, you're really not a multicultural pastor. You just happen to be a white person pastoring black people. Right, good point. Question. Um, what do you say as a pastor in Tampa, Florida, to a 70 year old pastor that's been preaching for a long time that says this to you? And, and I remember when I was younger, nothing. I, I'm speaking on behalf of all young, you know, I'm still young. I'm not going to say how I am, but I'm still, <laughs> nothing used to burn me up than hearing somebody say, son, you still uh, wet behind the ear, you still green behind. What do you say at your age? with the knowledge that you have, with the experience that you have, there's someone that says to you, Pastor Stevenson, you don't know, man, you ain't been around long enough to know what's going on with any type of movement. You just repeating something that you heard, son, you ain't old enough. What do you say to that? Man, that, that has been, that has always been my fight, man. Uh, <laughs> I'm a baby face. I can't get away from it. I really don't want to get away from it. I Me like too. A licking as young as I possibly can. <laughs> Uh, and I use it to my advantage as often as I can. Uh -huh. uh, I'm 41 years old. Uh -huh. um, at 41, uh, it's my responsibility to uh, to be a part of the solution. Uh, at 41, it's my responsibility to 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 reach up to the generation that was ahead of me. Uh, I remember growing uh -huh. up in community that was like village and Big Mama on the corner who didn't have a last name that was the same as mine could pull my coattail, beat my tail, and call my mama, and she was going with me when I got home too. Uh, but I'm also a part of the culture and the generation where uh, my, my friends in school were often those single mothers. My friends in school were often those 16-year-old mothers who uh, were having babies at an early age, and uh, they didn't have this, they, you know, it, it was so cool that they had a baby that they wanted to be their child's best friend, and and we've not always done the best we could at maturing those generations and in, in, in coming behind us. Uh, I, I stand in the swing. Um, I'm in the middle. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the young ones that still has zeal. I'm one of the younger ones that still has energy. Uh, I have influence in the ear of the younger people, but I still have a reverence for those individuals who've gone before me. Uh, what I find myself doing is listening for the voices of those individuals who reared me. I'm listening for the voices of those individuals who mentored me. I'm listening for the voices of my father. I'm listening for the voices of my hometown heroes. 
I'm listening for, I remember the individuals uh, in, in my hometown. I remember working for uh, Mr. Burden, who used to be, he, he was the first person to integrate the city high school back in my hometown. I, I remember those voices. I remember hearing the voice of Dr. Do, Dr. William Barber, who is, uh, old, you know, he's the president of the Poor People's Campaign. I grew up listening to his voice in the community, letting me know what it was like to be a black man, letting me know what it was to have the responsibility of being a voice in my community. So yeah, I'm young, yeah. I don't have the experiences that some have, but with what I have, I have a responsibility to my God and a responsibility to my community to speak mm -hmm. up and speak truth to power. As a young man, as a young man your age and you know, um, what what's going on in our community with what we're seeing in, in, in our nation today? Is there a correlation between that and the role or the lack of a role of the black father? Absolutely. Um, we, we've grown a generation now that doesn't know what a black father is. Mm -hmm. uh, now, a lot of boys who didn't have a black father are trying to father. And it's very difficult to uh, personify an example of something that you've never seen. Uh, mm -hmm. By and large, we, we already know about the cradle to prison pipeline. We already know mm -hmm. that in the third grade, they're pushing statistics to find out how many prisons and jail cells they need for black boys. And because of that, we know that the black male is under attack. We've always been under attack. There has never been a moment where the black male was not a threat to the counterparts in our society, but we've not done a good job as black men in general and as a community of insulating the black man. Um, here, here in Tampa, we're here in Florida, uh, we were able to get an amendment to Title IV, to Amendment IV. Uh, we were able to uh, allow those returning citizens to have their, their rights back. Well, we can't stop with just getting the returning citizens. They're right back in Florida. They're returning citizens all over this country. Um, yeah. You imagine what the black community's vote would be if they allowed everybody that they count in the census to be a counted vote in the ballots. It would be a completely different shift. The colors of our states would be completely different. And the individuals who are leading and representing our communities would have a completely different skin, uh, skin pigmentation than the individuals that we see. Mm -hmm. But we as a community have to be educated we got to understand what it is to vote. We have to accept the responsibility of the voting privilege. And we got to speak up for the individuals who are in the generations to come and for those who generations who've gone past who fought for our rights to, to vote. Uh, Pastor, um, I'm uh, trying to think of where I was today. I might have been in in supermarket. A young man walks past me, young uh, African-American male, probably mid-20s. And my skin started crawling because I, I feel myself getting old. Uh, one of the commenters on here, Dr. Gardner, I always talk about his age. He's 112, <laughs> but I'm not that old as Dr. Gardner is, but I feel myself getting up there. So this 20, about mid 20 year old young man walks past me and he, his pants are probably down to his knees. And, you know, and I want to just reach out and grab him and say, boy, pull your britches up. That's how I knew I was getting old because, because I, I wanted to say britches, <laughs> not pants. Yeah. What do we, what do we do as, as uh, males? What do we do to reach the next generation to tell them that the perception of how, how they're perceived as males means, uh, means so much. Uh, get off the porch. Um, okay. but what I mean, get off the porch. Um, uh, in North Carolina, we got land between our houses, and uh, mm -hmm. one of the things we revere in North Carolina is having a porch. Uh, after you get to a certain age, it seemed like all those uh, gatekeepers in your neighborhood would sit out on the porch, and those would be the individuals who, when you walk by, they would tell you what to do, but they never take the time to learn your name. Okay. Uh, what I learned about correction is correction can never come before relationship. So if I see you as a black man and I never had a male figure in my house, I've been still, I, some kids are still trying to find their father and they 50 some years old, still going through that trauma. How do you correct me as if you have a relationship with who I am or who I should be? Because yeah. all I ever see you is on the porch. I don't see you at the PTA meetings. I don't see you in the hood. You know, I, I, all I ever see you do is try to correct me, but you don't even take the time to find out who I am. Um, I think there's a, a gap in our generation and there's a divide 
that causes the voices of our elders to still not have the same kind of potential that it used to have. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't necessarily have the same kind of respect for elderly people that we used to. Um, we used to call them yes sir and yes ma'am, no sir and no ma'am. Now we call them pops. Hey you. You right. say what? You talking to me? I remember that that taste of blood that comes yeah. to my tongue every time I think about saying something crazy to an adult. When I have I have I'm 41 years old and I have adults to tell me not to call them sir or ma'am. And I think about the whoopings that I got as a young child to teach me exactly what to say. But we don't have that same kind of perspective now. Uh, we don't have that same kind of diligence from our adult population to learn the young adults and learn the kids and become a mentor. The Bible says that there are not many fathers. Uh, we don't have many fathers. It used to be back in the day that if your father was gone, you would find a father in your neighborhood and somebody will be accountable and responsible for you. We don't have that same kind of structure, and I'm hoping that from in, in some way uh, we can, as a community, uh, begin to take responsibility and engage each other. We don't even know the people who live to the left and the right. It used to be the fact that when somebody drove up to your neighborhood, uh, you knew exactly who they were, and if you didn't, somebody was going down the street to find out because we didn't just let any and anything happen in our hoods. But now you know. Uh, the neighborhood not the neighborhood anymore. You're, you're right. I want to ask you a question because you said something that my mind was, um, I want to paint a scenario. I want to ask you a, a leading question. You, you, you said about the porch and about your neighbors. Uh, you live in house 610 and your neighbor lives in house 612. Her name is Betty Johnson. What do you, when you were young, what did you call Betty Johnson? Uh, Miss Betty, uh, Miss Johnson. There you go. I really called her whatever name my parents allowed me to call her. Right. My you parents made it very plain to me exactly what her name was going to be, and I never crossed that line. Right. Even if I, even if I found out that her 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 family called her Pumpkin, she'll never be Pumpkin to me because I remember that taste of blood in my mouth. She'll never be, you know, she'll never be sugar or sweet. Right. She'll never be that to me right. because you know we we had a different standard. But uh, now, I, what do they? I, what I, I grew up in North Carolina where we beat children. What, <laughs> what, do you, what do you? What do they call them now? What do they, they call yeah. them? Pumpkin, whatever. Now, my oh, point was man. a level of respect. Yeah. Now, respect, but yet uh, now, now you said something else. And now you lead right into my question. I didn't even have to give you an alley oop. You just slammed it home. You said the the respect. You said that relationship, and then you said something that I think kind of flew under the radar. You said that you grew up in North Carolina where they used to beat children. Absolutely. I grew up in Philadelphia where they didn't beat children. They whipped them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a, I, I'm at my church right now, and okay. right outside is a good switch tree. There you go. All right. You don't know what a good switch tree is. Yeah, but see, in the, in the inner city of Philly, yeah. we didn't have switches. We had yeah. extension cords or shoes. Oh, yeah. or whatever. But the point is, you mentioned, the point I'm trying to make is relationship, relationship, but with the punishment that you were saying, you know, we, we don't have that relationship. Doesn't that apply also to our law enforcement? It does apply to law enforcement because um, if my father had not corrected to me at home uh somebody in a blue uniform would have corrected me in the street and because i was taught what it was to be a black man in my home i didn't have to learn it by being getting beat upside the head i didn't have to learn it while cuffs were behind my back uh my father was a police officer a career police officer before he became a pastor um i was never afraid of police officers my friend quentin lewis his dad uh, was officer friendly in my neighborhood. I, I, I had a good relationship with police officers. Um, I was never afraid of them. Uh, they 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 made a uh, presence in my schools. Uh, we knew them by name. We grew up dapping them high five. They would come on the basketball court and play with us when they weren't on duty. Uh, I never had an example of a police officer who would pull me over and not treat me fairly. Um, Is that because you had a relationship? Yeah, we have relationship. Right. So how important is it for our law enforcement to have relationship with the community? Uh, it's very important, but that's something that the community has to take responsibility of. Mm -hmm. uh, here, as everybody was protesting, uh, myself and uh, my brother, uh, attorney Norman Harris, 
Uh, he's another preacher, but he's an attorney by trade. Uh, we, we initiated something here in Tampa called Community Handshakes. Uh, we realized that the thrust and the tension of the young people at the front of this protest really didn't understand a lot of the parameters around the situation. All they knew was there was another hashtag. All they knew was there was, there was a, a, a lot of tension and a lot of energy that was driving their zeal, but they didn't have knowledge. Uh, me and Norman took it upon ourselves to create an atmosphere where the young people could come together and talk about their trauma. They could come to, uh, to the presence and have a forum with the elders. We could, we could be the, their face and remind them that yes, there is unrest in our communities. Listen, we take some of the responsibility for this because it, by and large, in a lot of ways, we didn't prepare you for what you're seeing. Now, this ain't the first time that black people have been killed. This ain't the first time that black people have lost their lives in the street. And we should have done what we should have done uh, during our generation to, to end this mess. A lot of the reasons why uh, young black people, uh, young, young blacks don't have a, a good relationship with olders is because they were born into a society they should have never seen. If we had done our jobs uh, during the Civil Rights Act, if we had done our jobs after we were able to live behind the gates and after we were able to be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, we would have pushed attention and some of the issues in our society and culture wouldn't be there for the young millennials who are coming up now. They don't understand. It's a bunch of confusion. I remember being told that I was just as good as any other white person. I remember being able to be one of the African-American uh, young males who was in the classroom when all my other friends didn't have as much homework as I did. I thought somebody was doing me wrong, but I had to realize that I was a representation of my community. And when I went to college, I didn't just go to college for myself. I took individuals in my community who couldn't go. I took their experience with me and I had to be responsible for being that person. We don't tell those stories anymore. Mm -hmm. The young people today don't even know what affirmative action was. So mm -hmm. we got to do a good job of, again, getting off the porch and letting our young people know what our responsibility is to take care of ourselves, to establish community and to be responsible in engaging our young people. Do you think, Pastor, and I'll get to this question by Dr. Gardner, but do you think there's a lot of pressure on the young black, um, I'll just say female, young black female going to college? Do you think she'll have a little more pressure on her than the than the white female going to college because uh, it's more than likely it's not always we're not talking a, a general uh, science but it's more likely that that black female is going to college and in the back of her mind she's saying i'm carrying this burden of going to college and if i graduate college i'll be the first one in my family to graduate college where it's more than likely uh, statistically, that white female that goes is just following in the footsteps of her mom or dad and her aunt. Isn't that a lot of pressure? <laughs> it, it is a lot of pressure, um, but pressure comes with perspective. Mm -hmm. And I say that to mean this. Uh, I, I, I had the privilege of going to a PWI, which is a predominantly white institution. Uh, I, I then became an administrator of an HBCU. Uh, looking at the difference in culture, looking at the difference in structure, uh, if that African-American young lady goes to that school thinking that Buffy is her friend, when she gets to her first job and she realizes that Buffy at that job ain't the same as Buffy that was her roommate, uh -huh. she will have a rude awakening. Uh, regardless of how it is that we find ourselves um, embracing likes and differences within cultures, at the end of the day, uh, you still black. Um, my daughters are 13 and 9. Uh, as they were going to elementary school, the teachers didn't want them to identify themselves by color. Uh, they were desensitizing my kids. But I know that if anybody's going to teach my child that they're black, I'd rather teach them my, that they're black while they're at home under my care than the world teaches them that they're black the first time they're done wrong. And then they come out in a moment of trauma that they're not prepared to, to, to take. Um, yes. A black person, male, female, ugly, short, tall, fat, slim, a black person in this society is always going to have a different perspective from their white counterparts. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are all white people aren't bad. No, they're not. No. But what I know is my community taught me how to deal with white people. Mm -hmm. Their community did not teach them how to deal with us. Mm -hmm. I remember being a firefighter in Goldsboro and uh, some of uh, some of the people I work with had never worked with black people before. Some of them had been on the farm, driving tractors since they were 10 years old. 
did not understand how to negotiate a stoplight. So you talk about now you got to live in quarters with a black person that you've been taught a particular way by your father and your grandfather and your uncle and all of them when they got around to their family reunion. Oh yeah, they still sporting black folks. But now you got to work alongside me. And I think that just because I got the same job as you, that you respect me, that's a completely different circumstance. So yeah, co college is an experience that teaches you. When I, my first day at East Carolina University, uh, I remember I, I, I got reported to school early for band camp and, a, and a, a, a candy apple green 67 Chevy with hydraulic pulled up beside me playing Tupac. And it was a white boy. And I was confused. <laughs> <laughs> College has a way of showing you uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But it's an experience that will always last for your lifetime. Uh, Pastor, uh, let's, because, um, let's see, let's try to throw a little uh, church in this conversation. Just a little bit of church, because you're a pastor. So I'm a church. Little bit. Just a little bit, because you're a pastor. Just, just a little bit. You know, we look at the Old Testament when uh, when 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 uh, Pharaoh realized that uh, there is a rumor of a deliverer coming up, and in the New Testament, when Herod realized there's a rumor of a deliverer coming up, they both said the same thing: Let's kill him at the root. Let's go after these male children. Let's go have these male babies. Let's go have mm -hmm. females. We love y'all. Y'all pretty got your lashes, you know, and all that. But we're going after the boys. Uh, Dr. Gardner is talking about Juwanza Kanufu, who says, Kanjufu, I'm sorry, who, who wrote a series of books on countering the conspiracy to destroy black boys. And he was he's asking the question, are you familiar with this? Or do you buy into or do you believe in this conspiracy theory that there's something out here that's going after our black boys? Get them at the root. Uh, the black male has always been the enemy of white society. Uh, based on how our family structures were, even from my African culture, the black male was the nucleus of the community. The house rose and fell on the voice of the African-American male. Uh, when it was that uh, we found out that there was these housing developments and projects the projects were never designed for us to live from generation to generation to generation. But what was taken out of this project was one, the dining room. The dining room took away the voice of the parents speaking to the children. The dining room took away that, that, that area and that space that caused family communal space. Uh, then we found out as it went along that uh, some women are given a choice. Either they're going to be given the social needs and services that they need to rear their children well. Uh, but sometimes that comes with the cost of child support. That comes with the cost of that black male not being allowed to live in that family. That comes with the cost of raising black children with never hearing the voice of their father. Uh, yes, absolutely. There is an assault out on black males. There, is, there has always been on assault out on black males, even down to the slavery stocks in town hall, uh, even down to the whipping post. There has always been an assault on black males. There's always been an assault on the black female because if you can uh, diminish the voice of the black male uh, based on how our culture goes, you also confuse the ear of the black female. Uh, our, our females were given over to Massa and whatever he wanted to do to her that night. And then she had to return to the household to act like everything was okay. Uh, there's been trauma dealt to us as a society. There's been trauma been dealt to us as a community, community and as a people. Uh, the purge has always happened. It was funny to me that they made a movie out of something that they've done from the beginning of time. And but but we've seen these messages that we as African Americans often laugh at as if it's comedy. Mm -hmm. But there's always truth to every joke. Mm -hmm. Always a moment of of aha to every time. It's, mm -hmm. it's just wrapped in a comedic moment to make you accept it, and that desensitizes you from how serious the situation really is. You know, we're going through something now. We're going through this uh, a lot of incidents, a lot of racial tensions, not just between cultures, but between law enforcement and uh, citizens. Uh, we recently went through something this week in which. Uh, gentleman just sleep in his car intoxicated i'm sure everyone's heard about that and um shot in the back 
what are your thoughts on what happened today in which the details of what happened were laid out that most of us didn't know about that he was shot that the officer missed him and ended up shooting in other people's cars and then instead of administering support to him you stand there and you kick him like he's a dog you stand on his shoulders like he's a, like like he's a uh, a deer that you just now now that's one side of it. the other side of it says that okay it didn't take months it didn't take weeks they went on and said listen here are 11 charges against you uh the protests are still going people are still angry some are upset about the fact that, okay you charged him with 11 charge you gave him 11 charge and then you gave him over 24 hours to turn himself in now i don't know about you but i don't think they're gonna give me 24 hours to turn myself in they ain't gonna give you 24 hours to turn yourself in uh they're not going to allow you to still serve on the community watch uh they're not going to allow you to go to burger king and get you a cheeseburger uh they're not going to allow you any privileges that we see by and large given to our white counterparts uh because you ain't white that's just the, that's just the nitty-gritty of it uh life ain't fair uh and and we have to live within the means of our experience um, we've seen a black president. Okay. Uh, now you see Trump, but the responsibility of our community does not rest in one seat in one office in one white house. The responsibility of our community rests in us. Uh, mm -hmm. if we're not going to vote, then you're subjecting yourself to the same situation over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. If your community has not got together to decide which black person is going to run for mayor and no other black person run against them. Right. And all right. the individuals in your black community are going to show up and vote for that one black person. Then you're not preparing yourself to make any kind of change in your community. If you're not deciding what districts black people are affected by the most and putting up one black candidate for the black community to vote against the vote for, then you're not doing anything to change the isms and issues of your society. If you've not figured out how to figure out what the laws are, if you've not set yourself down with someone who can talk about reg about legislation and talk about it from not an emotional perspective, but break right. down the bill. Let's talk about how right. guns and butter and sugar and abortion and all these things got locked into one bill. Let's talk about who these individuals are that are representing us and why don't mm -hmm. we hold them accountable other than when they want to come to our black churches and kiss our black babies and have their sound bites right. and their picture photo ops. If we're not taking it upon ourselves to make a change in how we're responsible for our communities, the, the issue is going to be cyclical and lagging. We're still going to see uh, the re effects of our bad representation, our bad voting choices years to come. But if we don't stop the cycle, the cycle is going to continue. And we talked about this, I believe um, you said you saw the show we did with Apostle McNair. We talked about this. That is not the White House seat. Absolutely. <laughs> it's that seat around the corner from. Absolutely. Uh, well, I'm in Carolina. Let me say it like this. It's the seat around the corner. Yep, the corner. Yes, sir. On the local level. Yes, sir. Uh, you got to be uh, well aware of who you're voting for. Mm -hmm. And everybody that look like you ain't for you. Uh, there are some individuals when we have a, a meeting as a community, uh, there are some individuals in our community that uh, pick up the phone that uh, are, are on, 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 uh, have their phones on speakerphone and they're letting master know what's going on in the midst of us before we can even make plans amongst ourselves. Uh, what I hate right. seeing is black on black crime. And I'm not talking about us shooting each other. What I'm talking about is us killing each other's voices before we get started. Um, right. It is the case in our communities that a lot of times we'll find fervor and we'll find value and the preachers fight against Black Lives Matter. And, you know, the clergy wants to fight against the politicians. The clergy want to be politicians. The, the, the people in the community don't respect the voice of the, of the pastors. So when the clergy tries to become a politician, ain't nobody voting for them because they don't speak with the voice of the people. And our communities have just become a mess. And we're not doing anything to pull it together. We're not having any town hall meetings. We only get together for funerals. And at a funeral, it's all too late. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. What about the uh, one of the things that I'm hearing a lot of people saying behind the scenes is 
you know, we're doing all this Black Lives Matter stuff. We're talking about Black Lives Matter and it's really not that bad things. You know, we just need to focus on um, Malcolm. I keep referring to Malcolm's speech about the house Negro. Yes, sir. <laughs> black lives have got to matter to black people first. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying about that is I appreciate the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, it, 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 it cries aloud and spares not just like the uh the conviction and the commandment on preachers mm -hmm. uh but what i'll say is this um our lives will matter to us when we as a community take responsibility for our community mm -hmm. i'm not saying that there should be justice I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that we have equal opportunity under the law i'm not saying that our society gives us the same chance as others but what i will say is that we're responsible for us we always have been, we always will be. When we look back at examples of the 60s and 70s, the reason why black communities were strong was because there were black Panthers. The reason why our black communities were strong because there was a presence of the black church. The reason why our black communities were strong was because at the end of the day, we realized that whether you was from the nation of Islam or from Ebenezer Baptist Church, you a black person in this neighborhood and we gotta look out for each other. Mm -hmm. We don't see those sentiments today. We don't we don't find each other. the protests have been the first time we've seen each other marching together in forever. But after the protest, we didn't organize after the protest. We ain't mobilizing. Most of our protests has been us being allowed to walk around in our own communities. We're not even able to call any civil disrest arrest. We're not even able to call the mayor and the police chief and the sheriff and the sheriff to even make any uh, any any call to actions based on our demands. Because well, over that, and over again, when people speak up to talk for the black community, they, uh, ain't, they ain't talking with our voice. We don't know them people. Right. Well, my question to you is, and we talked about this on the previous show because you used the word demands. What are our demands? If you if you pull people from the protest line and say your protest work, you get an opportunity. You're going to sit down with the governor. You're going to sit down with the mayor. You're going to sit down with your uh, county commissioners. You're going to sit down with, with your local senator and tell them what you want. Most people will say, uh, I just want uh 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 <laughs> yeah we, we don't know what we want because we're not prepared for the conversation you don't prepare for that conversation when the conversation approaches uh uh bad preparation causes pain mm -hmm. uh, so when it is that they do come and ask you what you want why you're crying what it's just like a baby you ask a baby why they crying they can't even communicate what it is you get right. them you're supposed to be mature <laughs> when they and ask you, you, right. you have some deliverables. And do you think they mind? Do you think they care or mind that we're marching around? They let you march. <laughs> you call them to ask them for permission and you ask them, can you march in the route? You ain't protesting. They possess you. They, they still got you running around your Hamptons wheel. The only time that you are protesting is when you are doing something against the norm. You're doing something against the social society. When you're doing something to cause civil unrest, looting in our own communities is stupid. <laughs> you're not you're not you're not doing anything to cause us to move forward. All you're doing is causing for another black person to have to go back and repair something that we broke. Right. So my question is this. When we talk about reparations, what are we going to repair? Before right. we talk about is that our, what we're owed back because of where we've come from, from slavery, where we've come from as an unjusted people, what it is that we're going to repair? And normally, if somebody gave us something like a stimulus check, we wouldn't even allow that stimulus check to be used in the black community. We'll take that $1,200 and go buy them Jordans. We'll take that $1,200 right. and go shop at that mall. We ain't going to take that $1,200 and use that economic impact to stimulate our own selves. We're going to go right back to the same isms and isms that we've always had. And it's because we've not done a good job of educating our community. We've not done a good job of talking about what economic development really is. We right. know that the black person in the community owns a restaurant, they own a store, but we ain't going over there. Normally, it's the white folks that support the black restaurant that put the black owner on. And then we ask him for a discount, but we ain't even patronizing their business. It's like it's an ism in our society. It's often called crabs in a barrel mentality. But I think it's a whole lot more like Russian roulette than crabs in a barrel because now it don't matter who we kill. We're just killing everybody. Just killing, right. And the moment we, I, we don't like the service at a, at a white establishment, 
we complain and we go, we'll come back, we'll go, we'll come back. But if it's in a black establishment, we say, you know, that's why I don't even like supporting them. And that's we want a discount. We want a discount from a black brother. Right. You know, we'll take our good money and go to these white establishments. We'll go to the domesticated restaurant. But when we go to the soul food restaurant, can you add a little bit more? No, pay for what you need. Yeah. And then, like you mentioned, with the looting in your own community, in essence, most of the time, you don't, you tore up the store and it's the white person that benefits because they're the contractors that's going to come in and have to rebuild and you're making them wealthy. <laughs> then that black store is not going to have to possibly find another insurance company to carry them because right. now the insurance is dropped. That black family, now that they still got medical bills of grandma and grandpa, they still got doctor mm -hmm. bills, they still got, and, and, and we as a community are not going to go back and help them rebuild the store. No. That we We're tearing our own stuff up. Yeah. It's sad. How do we protest? Uh, I think we protest by one, figuring out what our call to action is first. Uh, protest normally happens out of emotion and not strategy. Uh, mm -hmm. Normally, uh, in our communities, when we've been by and large successful, it's been when our community fathers and mothers have come together to develop a strategy. So when, when Big Mama knows that the young kids are going to protest, I'm not expecting for Big Mama to walk two miles with them in a the protest. Right. But I do need for Big Mama to walk out there in front of the protest and say, now look, baby, after you finish protesting, I want you to come back over here under the shade tree. We're going to drink some lemonade and let me tell you what you need to ask for. That's mm -hmm. what we're not seeing. It's, right. it's not a case of we're expecting for all of the older community to come out. We know that they're not even physically able, but we right. do need to hear their voices. We do need to know that, they, that we have their back. We do need to know that they're concerned with us because that's how you get young people with zeal and not knowledge. The knowledge is sitting on the porch. Right. So what's next for us? What can we do as a young, as young people? You're a young pastor. I'm sure you deal with what can the young generation do? And the reason I'm asking this question is because one of the young people said on an earlier show that uh, my friends don't want to vote because they voted last election. And every election that we voted in since elementary school, whoever got the most votes won. But this past election, the one with the most votes didn't win and it discouraged them because of the electoral college. What do we say to the young people to inspire? What do you say? Because you have a platform. Uh, what do you say to inspire young people during times like this? Well, there's a difference between telling somebody what to do and telling them how to do it. Mm -hmm. We can tell people to vote, but we ain't telling them what to vote for. Mm -hmm. We can tell them what to vote, but they don't even know what the issues are. All they're doing is being just like everybody else and picking a popular person. Let we're gonna right. pick the names that sound like a black name. So <laughs> Rafika and 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 all them folks, Jamasha Way and all them, them the folks, them the folks we're gonna vote for. And sometimes those aren't even the individuals who have uh, who have legacy in our community. Those aren't even individuals who understand our community. Those are often sometimes people who own land to have addresses in our neighborhoods just so they can get in seats mm -hmm. um we got to educate our young people we got to educate our folks in terms of what it means when your vote doesn't count because if you ain't voting for me what kind of friend are you if you really love me you would understand what your responsibility is as our, as our community mm -hmm. uh, if, if you told a young black man that him not voting said that when it comes time for your kids to get an education understand that who you put on this school board has all to do with whether or not your child is going to be able to, to, to apply for a scholarship. When you put somebody on this judicial system for the, the, the court system, it's going to have a, a direct implication on whether or not your 16-year-old child gets a fair trial or not. If we say right. voting from that perspective and we let people know who it is in our community that represents our community and shut all this black-on-black -black voting down, then we'd be a lot, uh, we getting a lot more headway into getting what it is we want as a community. But mm -hmm. it takes being responsible and engaged and having relationships amongst each other. What kind of platform are you using to get this message out? Um, I'm using a platform uh, called The Movie. Uh, it's a movie coming out on July the 4th called Justice on Trial. The movie is written and produced by uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Cooper. And uh, there are, are churches and pastors all over the country who have come together to help this uh, become a successful event. We're premiering a movie 
Uh, it's already premiered in AMC theaters in February, but we wanna bring it back around on the 4th of July. Why the 4th of July? Because it's Independence Day for some people, but we ain't finding out that we ain't independent. And releasing a movie called Justice on Trial, where in this movie it portrays uh, the United States Justice Department versus uh, the, the people, the African-American community versus the United States Justice Department. And there are examples of individuals who are serving as defendants. Um, Edgar Evers, Omega Evers, you hear his story about how he was this justice. Harriet Tubman, you hear her story. Emmett Till, the stories of uh, individuals that we talked about uh, during African American History Month, but get watered down in the in the in the history books. Mm -hmm. Those are the individuals, and I believe it's an awesome opportunity for our young people to hear more about our heritage, to understand what reparations are. Because we hear people throwing around numbers about reparations, but we as a community by and large haven't taken the moment and opportunity to really understand what that concept is, or we would be talking about it a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm doing. I'm a pastor here in the community. Uh, we're launching a community garden. We're having our ribbon cutting on Sunday. We found a way to have sustainable nutrition and taking that as a, a, a suitable resource and a, a responsibility as our church. Um, as a black pastor, as an African-American male, I'm doing all I can to reach as many young adults as I can, to reach as many youth as I can, to cry aloud and spare not. And I appreciate you for even allowing me uh, to come and use my little voice on your platform tonight. This has been wonderful. Well, Pastor, I thank you for, we've been on here hours. It seemed like we've been just flying by, but um, again, everyone, I do want to reiterate that it's, it's called, the movie is called Justice on Trial. And we spoke about, I'm going to try to, we're going to try to promote that and get that out so that everyone can see that. I did see a clip of it and it, 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 it it's very powerful. Yeah. It's a, provo it's a very provocative movie. Uh, it's going to be a movie that causes people to have more conversations, but mm -hmm. after we finish having conversations, we got to organize, we got to strategize, we got to find relationships, and we got to find common bonds uh, so that we can become a community again. Yes, sir. Man, thank you so much for coming on, man. This was uh, awesome. I love the, the discussion. Um, before you go, I'll give you a minute if you want to say something to everyone, to our younger generation, to those, um, uh, whatever it is, I'll just give you the floor to have what you have, you, you know, you want to say to us in, in parting. Yes, sir. Uh, listen. Uh, my name is R.J. Stevenson. Uh, I was a young black kid raised in a black community. I didn't have everything I wanted, but God made sure that I had everything I needed. And I need for you to take responsibility of where you live. Uh, you got to be responsible for your neighborhood. You got to be responsible for your block. You got to be responsible for your community. Listen, God didn't put you where you are with the kind of mental capacity that you have to just be ordinary. He made you to be extraordinary. He made you to be the solution to somebody else's problem. Too many times we find our young brothers and sisters being injustice, being killed. Uh, the only way that we can make certain that we have another day is to use wisely the day that God has given us now. Don't wait until somebody dies to speak, to speak up. Don't wait until it's one of your homeboys or one of your homegirls to be a motivator. Take responsibility for your community now. Make your community proud no matter where you are. Yeah, if you're able to go and live behind the gate, live behind the gate, but understand that you're still a black man. You're still a black woman. You still have a responsibility to the community to be who you are in dark places. Let your light shine so that everybody will see God and glorify your father who, who is in heaven. My name is Pastor R.J. Stevenson, and I hope that you've, ex you've experienced something awesome uh, in the Dire Tribe tonight. Wow, that was awesome, man. I, <laughs> I thought you were going to say I'm Pastor R.J. Stevenson, and I approve this message because you, uh -huh. you gave my vote. <laughs> you got my vote. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got my vote. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate you, man. Stay strong down in Tampa. Stay strong around the country. Stay strong around the world. Your voice is making an impact in our world. Thank you so much. God bless. Bless you too. I want to thank Pastor R.J. Stevenson for joining us tonight. This was an awesome uh, show, awesome conversation. I thank you all for joining us tonight. It's good to have every time I get a, a younger person on here, it's just so powerful because it gives us an opportunity to realize that there is hope that all is not lost. The previous generation, they fought. 
this generation is fighting the next generation is fighting and we're going to keep fighting we're going to keep fighting and we're going to keep on fighting i believe as a couple of weeks ago last week whenever it was that we had apostle brian keith williams on here i think we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and as long as you have men of god pastors like pastor rj stevenson that is doing something not just standing up talking about it but doing something then there is hope we're going to keep promoting we're going to get you the information for july 4th when this movie that comes out justice on trial uh, I saw some clips of it. It's powerful. I saw some of the actors in it. I recognize that guy. It is a powerful movie. Justice on Trial. It's, it's just going to be amazing. You'll hear more information about it in the days to come. I want you to take some time tonight and hit the share button so that we can get uh, this broadcast out so that other young people, it is imperative. It is important, ladies and gentlemen. Let me say this before we go off the air. It is important that we share this broadcast, not so that the name David Bright Austin can go out. That's, that doesn't mean anything to me now. Uh, it doesn't. What means something to me is that our young men that are on Facebook or YouTube will see the testimony of R.J. Stevenson and say, wait a minute, this guy did it. This guy is a positive influence maybe i can do something that's what it's about it's about one person it's about one person seeing someone positive i remember i remember years ago one of my favorite movies that i love to watch is the movie die hard and in die hard if you've seen die hard there's a series of them. i don't a series of them i don't know if in probably about 10 of them now but i remember die hard number two in die hard number two at the end of the movie the planes were hovering over dulles airport in dc and they were running out of fuel and they thought that the planes were going to crash because everyone didn't have any fuel and what happened was one of the planes a plane crashed the plane of the enemy the plane of the enemy crashed in the snow the trail of flames left behind a road map that one plane used the the fuel line, the fiery fuel line of the enemy to land. When that plane landed, the other planes looked and one of the pilots said, hey, that plane landed by the flames of the enemy. Watch what he said. He said, if he could do it, so can we. If they could do it, so could we. People like Pastor R.J. Stevenson, not trying to be a famous individual, what he's doing is he's saying, listen, the enemy is doing what he does, but the enemy is leaving a flame behind for us to see how we can land, how we can survive. And if I could do it, so can you. We need to let our young men and young women know that there are positive young people out here, such as Pastor R.J. Stevenson, that is telling them, if I can do it, so can you. Share this broadcast make a difference, make an impact. That's why we're here, to make a difference. We're not here to do anything else but make a difference in our society, to make a difference in our community. Dr. Martin Luther King made this saying famous, that if I can help somebody while I pass this way, then my living will not be in vain. Every one of you watching this broadcast tonight, myself included, we have a date with destiny in which we won't be here any longer. And when we close our eyes for the last time, will we be able to say that my living was not in vain? How do we say that? By helping somebody. Who do we help? We help those in need. We help the oppressed like Jesus Christ always did. Our people are being oppressed. Our people, the people of this world, no matter what color, no matter what ethnicity, when someone is in trouble, we have to step in. It just so happens it's our time. We need help and you are the one what if you what if your voice is the voice that god is calling to help change a generation i believe you can do it tomorrow night miss melissa elliott's gonna be here and we're gonna be talking about what we said earlier we're gonna be talking about what she's doing with gang awareness and what she's doing helping the community because even in a pandemic even in a situation where uh we have racial tension let me tell you something the work can't stop. I know there's something terrible going on. I know you got to walk around with a mask and gloves and all of that, but let me tell you something. The work can't stop. The work 
can't stop and you can't stop and you can't let anything stop you you got too much fight in you i said this the other night and i'll say it again i don't want to be around people that say man things aren't going to change it's just going to always be like this if it's not going to change then don't get out the bed tomorrow just lay in the bed and cry but i believe you can get out of the bed and you can make a difference make a difference in this world on friday night we're going to go at it we're going to have cnn part two we're going to have a panel i don't even want to tell you who it is but we're going to have a panel on here and we're going to go at it we're going to get some answers we're going to debate we're going to go at it we're going to just lay it on the line we're going to keep pulling that on one another until we find out what we need to do i don't know about you but i'm ready to see some changes take place my friends when you go to bed tonight i need you to do me one favor look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself did i work toward my destiny tonight did i work toward my destiny today while i was up and about or did i simply waste another day i'll see you tomorrow night i love you and there's nothing that you can do about it <laughs>